Tigers, Gators for the championship. Check this out. LSU's Cade Veloso's father is grilling Gator. Oof. That's how you get pumped for tonight's game three. A series that has turned 180 degrees. Oh, yeah. Then 360. Oh, yeah. Then another 180, and the beat goes on. Let's go. Goes on and the beat goes on. David Dennis, you're the only one who got that, okay. <laughs> of course. We'll get to the College World Series in a second. A big weekend in Major League Baseball. Two hottest teams going at it. Let's talk about Atlanta, Cincinnati. Tell me this didn't feel like October baseball. Great American ballpark rocking. Friday was lunacy with Big Ellie's cycle. Since he got the win to get to 12 straight, could they carry it through the weekend? No, Atlanta back with the one-run win Saturday, the one-run win Sunday. Some thrilling baseball. Clinton Yates around the horn to you. Was this weekend more about Atlanta or the Reds? As much as we love the Reds and what they're doing. By the way, if you hit for the cycle and get a stolen yeah. base, we call that a motorcycle in these streets. But the Braves in general, <laughs> it's my opinion that they've been the that. best team in Major League That's Baseball great. for the past three seasons, <laughs> even if they only have one ring. Olsen's back to hitting homers. Acuna's out here hitting the ball off the wall. And Michael Harris, the second as well, is still getting extra bases. They are just too hard to stop from a lineup standpoint. And Strider didn't even throw in that series. I love what the Reds are doing, but the Braves are the best team in baseball, in my opinion, even if you throw in the race. Courtney Cronin, more about Atlanta or Cincinnati this weekend? The Reds are a good team. You know what would make them great, Tony? Getting some starting pitching. This rotation is 28th with a 5.91 ERA. They've got injuries that they're going to be dealing with for quite some time for Nick, Nick Lodolo, Hunter Green. The hitting kept them in these games, but it's the pitching that fell apart. And this is what happens when you underfund your lineup. Remember, they traded away Luis Castillo. They traded away Sonny Gray. By the way, both of those two guys are top 11 in ERA this season. Mm -hmm. This pitching situation that they're dealing with is rearing its ugly head, and this is a type of thing that could derail even the best of luck. Okay. So that's what I took away from this that's weekend. They've got to get that fixed come the deadline. A lot of clouds, a lot of rain on Cincinnati, underfunded. They're putting the fun in underfunded, though. This has been a, a fun team. Uh, David Dennis Jr., I know you're in Atlanta. Was this weekend more about Atlanta or Cincinnati? Yeah, as the only panelist here hailing from the city of Goody Mob, Equimini, and Lemon Pepper Wet, we're going to talk about the Atlanta Braves and what they've been doing. And these, la these last five games, especially ending the Phillies run, ending the Reds one run, four and one, Olsen five homers during that time, 17 and four in June, establishing, establishing themselves as the team to beat. Get this, last 10 games, 116 hits, 82 runs, 29 homers, 11 stolen bases. No other team in the history of baseball has put together those stats right? over a 10-game stretch. Is that stretch. right? This wow. is the Braves making a statement that they are the team to beat in Major League Baseball. Say that again. We're talking about the, the 27 Yankees, the, the 61 Yankees, the, the, the great Mariners team, and, and all the great teams of all time, the big red machine. Nobody has done what Atlanta's done offensively over the last 10 games? Nobody. Frank Isola, I'll bring you in here. I, I've got three now, of course, for Atlanta this weekend, meaning more. Cincinnati was right there with them in all three games. Yeah, well, let's just be clear. The 27 Yankees never faced these pitching stats before, especially these horrible relievers that everybody throws out. That's another story. <laughs> Come on, guys. We all knew the Atlanta Braves would be here. This is about the Reds. They haven't done anything in nearly 15 years. They sell out their ballpark only the seventh time in Major League history. Two teams with at least an eight-game yeah. winning streak yeah. have faced each other to start a series. And, I, you know, De La Cruz reminds you a little bit of all the hype around Fernando Tatis Jr. Such an exciting player, but it's similar to what goes on with the Angels, where you have Trout and you have Otani, have these great players, but it still comes down to what Courtney said, the pitching, until they figure that out. Playoff baseball, you said it, Tony, is one-run games. They lost two of them. Clint Yates back in. They're the first team in the National League to get to 50 wins. That tells me all I need to know. Atlanta is, yes, of course. Frank Isola, the pitching staffs, the 27 Yankees went up against, weren't thrown at guys throwing 101, 102 out of the pen in the eighth and ninth oh, inning. I mean, uh, you, know it's, you know it's different. You know it's different. Gary will hit off anybody. <laughs> we'll move on. Florida LSU tonight for the championship. Let's go. The question of whether you have more faith in Tigers or Gators 
turned on its head the way LSU won game one like they did with pitching dominance in 11 innings and then turned back with 24 runs for Florida yesterday. So for the question, who would you rather be and who do you have more faith in, we start with Clinton Yates. You were there this weekend. I'd rather be LSU because I simply think this team has more clutch pop than Florida does. Yesterday's game was a different circumstance. If you've been to Charles Schwab Park in Omaha, you know how it plays during the day. It's much hotter. The ball gets out. This is mm. a night game. Mm. This is a completely different scenario. And I was at that game against Wake in which they had to come back. It was a 0-0 mm. game all the way up through 10. They managed to pull it out. I just think they've got a little bit more in the tank if it's going to be a close one. Did you hear Yates there? Multiple times referencing as the only person there. Uh, Cordy, I don't know how you could respond to somebody who saw with his own eyes like Yates did, but, but who do you like? Who would you rather be going into this game tonight? I want to be LSU because they are the masters of clutch hitting. If this game goes to overtime, it's over. LSU's taken that one away. They love the 11th inning, these walk-off home runs, the one that got them into the College World Series uh, finals, and then the one that happened on Saturday night. And if I've got a rotation of anything that consists of Paul Skeens, Thatcher Hurd, Griffin Herring, and Riley Cooper, I like my chances. They've got... They've got all the tools needed to make sure that what happened in Game 2 doesn't carry over into Game 3, and I'm pretty confident that we will end up seeing Paul Skeens in some capacity, probably a starter's capacity, on Monday night. Mm, I want to talk about that in a second. David Dennis Jr., first, though, the question, who would you rather be going into the win or go home? <laughs> I know, I know Yates was there, but we talk about the sun and the gravitational pull and the rays. 24 <laughs> runs. That cannot be the explanation for how you put 24 <laughs> runs up on the board. They just hit the ball very far for a lot of that game, Clinton. So the, the, I, I, the stuff that you could say about LSU, you could say the same thing about Florida. That clutch uh, performances, Florida won the first three games by one run each for uh, to, to start this thing off. They're averaging eight runs a game, and you're dealing with the LSU team that's got to cobble together a bullpen and pitchers to uh, do this uh, for game three. I'm going with Florida. They put up 24 runs, guys. I think they can do something, you know, similar going Momentum game three. is your next day starting pitcher. Frank Isola knows that one well from the 27 Yankees. Go ahead, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> well, since we're checking passports, I was there when Kirby Puckett hit the home run against okay. Charlie Liebrandt. Then the Braves come back from game <laughs> seven. That's a gut punch. I was there when Ray Allen hit the shot against the San Antonio mm. Spurs. Gut punch. Spurs lose the deciding game. If I'm going to lose a game like that, I'd rather give up that many runs. Six home runs and I commit five errors. That's an absolute freak show. It can't be any worse. I think emotionally, I think you're in a better place, and I think your lineup is better. Come on. They won 53 of 70 games, LSU. They were ranked number one in the country for most of the year for a reason. They'll be okay tonight. DC, back in. To, to Frank's point about LSU, think about what their schedule was this past week and why sa Sunday's win was such an anomaly. Yep. They played Monday through Thursday, had one day rest before they went into the final. Florida had two games last week in the same stretch that LSU played, and they go in on two days rest each time. So chalk this up as a, a maybe exhaustion, maybe just bad luck. I know that Riley Cooper, maybe he ate that alligator. I don't know. He was in his hotel room with some sort of stomach <laughs> bug. But if he's got a close tonight, I imagine he's going to yeah. be there. Yeah, not not something you want to eat medium rare, I would imagine. Talk to me about Paul Skeens tonight, Clinton. It's for the national championship, right? And you know he's a gamer. He's also possibly going to be the number one pick in the draft in two weeks. How much you think in Skeens should pitch after throwing 120 on Thursday? You know, this is a tough situation. I don't think you're going to see him get above 50 pitches, but if it were me, I would start him. I think that there is an advantage to that. I mean, mm. the bottom line is that if you've got the best guy on your staff who's even remotely available, starting it off with him, it makes more sense. But the other thing is, is that LSU led the country in games in which they – fell behind, and came back to win. So, for me, you're going to want to get out in front, but they kind of have a little bit of backup. I think Hurd might start, but I was starting. But the decision-making process is you would consider his future career prospects, cap him at 50 or so, or start him. I saw you shaking your head no, David Dennis Jr. I wouldn't mind actually having him close this game. That way, you know, this team is known, as Clinton mentioned, for how they have their clutch performances. But also, you can guarantee that you limit him if you can get out of that game in nine innings. So maybe bring him in the eighth. Uh, I agree the uh, 50 pitches or so should be good, but I would rather actually close him. Frank, you know 
he's going to want to pitch. He's going to want to empty everything in his arm. And, and he, to be a legend would be an amazing thing. But he's also could be the number one pick in the draft. If you're managing, what are you thinking? Yeah. Well, I, I think the manager thinks of every player, and I think you're right. Look at the expression on his face. You're saying that in his final college game against the guys that he's with, been with all year, he doesn't want to pitch. He's going to be out there. And Clinton and David both bring up a, a, an excellent point. He's going to pitch. It's just a matter of now where the manager is going to pitch him. A guy like that, can you imagine him looking his teammates in the face? Well, I'm, I'm worried about being the number one pick. I'm not buying that. He'll pitch I mean, tonight, I, he should pitch. It would be his throw day, right? I mean, so, so the idea of him throwing exactly. after – Cordy Crowden, I'll, I'll let 20, you in on this, 30, and we'll go back pitches. to you, Clinton. I'm all for protecting players from themselves, and I know he's going to come into this and say, I want to pitch. But when you think about if he's the number one, number two draft pick, whatever it is next week, that team already knows that they're going to be shutting him down for quite some time. So however many pitches he goes tonight, I don't think that's going to affect anything that happens when the draft rolls around. But taking a look at what happened two years ago for Mississippi State in 2021, Will Bednar pitched 108 pitches against the Longhorns. Three days later, throws 97 to get Mississippi State into the College World Series Finals, then on three days rest, has an unbelievable performance as a starter in Game 3. I think that the I think LSU probably follows the same sort of recipe. Put your ace where he needs to go, lead things off, and hope that you can ride his hot hand into a championship. The last word on this. These two teams are conference matchups, but they didn't play all season. No, they didn't. The game is right. a little bit different. The reason why you don't close him is because you might never get to him if the game doesn't get there. He's just too good to take All him. right, make a pick for the game and for the championship tonight. Clint Yates. LSU, I think Trey Morgan is going to have Courtney a heck of a night. Go Tigers. Mm -hmm. David Dennis Jr. <laughs> Florida. Frank Geisel. Courtney is go Tigers. We'll take a break. Fire sell this. LSU wins. It's Gomaha. That's what it is. Two coming. Popped up. Marsh is there. And the Mets 42nd loss of the year is their most horrific. Gary Cohen with the call. Points for everybody for Gary Cohen, huh? Mets June gloom continues. Eighth inning yesterday. They collapsed because they walked three, hit two, and made one error. Buck Showalter looked gobsmacked after the game. If you had a chance to redo that eighth inning, would you do anything different, or was that like how? What else could we do? So. Frank, you're a billionaire owner. Is there something else you can do? Is there a managerial shakeup on the horizon here? I'm, I'm not doing that. Buck Schoelt has been around long enough. I'm giving. I'm not getting rid of him in June. But when Buck talks about that eighth inning, what could I have done? You have Robertson warming up in the bullpen, striking out imaginary batters. That's when the game is getting away from you. But you look at this team, that ancient starting pitching staff. If you look at every major category, they all rank in the bottom third. You know that they have to go 53 and 35 just to get to 87 wins, which is basically the low bar for making, getting a wild card. But you're not making a move. It's only June, he says. July is next week. David Dennis Jr., uh, are you making a move here? It, I, I'm not really making a move with Showalter. I mean, the, the big issue here is the roster construction, that $340 million roster that's yeah. only given you a team that is 26 and ERA. And the problem with Showalter having to make this decision is he doesn't have enough relievers that he can just rely on. He's trying to figure out how to do all of this. The big move here is understanding that this team is done. That championship window is done. The Scherzer Verlander combo is done. Blow it up and try to figure out what you can do next. Championship window. Courtney Cronin, I turn to you. Bizarre. He, Buck Showalter was the National League Manager of the Year a year ago, and now we're talking about 
whether we'd can him before July. This is a roster construction issue, as David brought up, the $341 million roster that they have, and they have about three reliable arms uh, in the bullpen. But on top of that, remember what happened in the 2016 American League Wild Card game when Buck Showalter was with the Baltimore Orioles. Mm. The exact same reasoning he gave for not using David Robinson yesterday is what happened with uh, with Br Zach, uh, Zach Britton right. back in 2016. He was fresh for the offseason, though. Clinton Yates, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, half the reason I'm making a change is because I'm listening to Buck, who sounds like he wants to make a change as well, getting a little testy with the New York media there. Overall, though, no, there's no championship window. We haven't seen anything <laughs> close to that. The best thing that happens yeah. every year for the Mets is the home run derby and Pete Alonso, and that's coming up next week. Your season's almost over, kiddos. Yeah. Got to make the playoffs to get a championship window for Right. Yeah. <laughs> Buy or sell two, NBA. Sam Amick's report today that James Harden's player option looks like it's down to two teams. Stay in Philly or free agency to Houston. A decision deadline is Thursday. The suspense is terrible here. I hope it lasts. Isola playing for a could-be contender in Philly or return to Houston with a young squad. I, I need someone to explain to me why the Houston Rockets would want James Harden. It makes no sense. I've heard whoever offers the most money, this isn't about championship or going to a rebuilding team, playing with young guys. It's all about money at this point. The best place for him is Philadelphia, where at least you have a chance to win toward the tail end of your David career. David Dennis Jr.? This is all about what James Harden ultimately values. If he wants to win a championship, yeah, he would try to stay with Philly, but I'm not sure how high that is on his list of priorities compared to hanging out with his friends and family in Houston and making as much money as humanly possible. And James Harden has spent the last 10 years with everybody lambasting him for his Game 7 performances and his playoff performances. Maybe he don't want to deal with that anymore. He wants to go hang out and, you know, do the hookah thing and play with all his buddies. And you, Gordy Cronin. So why would they want him? Exactly. Philly's not ready for a gap year here. They're the only team that can offer him the four-year, $213 million max contract. I think that money will end up playing a role here. But I'm going to disagree with something Frank said. Why would Houston want James Harden at this point of his career? No, he's not the scorer he used to yeah. be. But he did lead the league in assists last season, second time in his career that he did that. They've got a young core. They have Amen Thompson. They might want someone who could bring that veteran sort of leadership. David just said he wants to hang defense, out. That's why well, I don't know. I don't understand why they would want him. He just wants to hang out. I think that from an on-court veteran leadership perspective, James Harden can bring that to help raise the floor for some of the young guys. It's just not going to lead to a championship because their window is, uh, I don't even know if it's open, closed, or what it is. It's just a pain right now because they're not contending for a championship soon. With Yates. Yeah, it's definitely not a window. And if I'm in a situation where Nick Nurse has to convince James Harden, Nick Nurse who's won something, James Harden who hasn't, that he should stay with that team, I'm not so sure I need him either. That's ridiculous to me. I don't understand why the Sixers would be spending that much money on that guy at this stage of his career. No way, no how. Buy or sell three WNBA All-Star starters announced. Asia Wilson, Brianna Stewart are going to be the captains. Aaliyah Boston made starter as a rookie. You don't see that often. Three aces made starting, and Brittany Griner is a starter. Do you think someone snubbed? And Alyssa Thomas has a phenomenal case for that. Please throw that out here. Or, Cordy, tell me what you're most impressed by. It's going to seem like the obvious answer, but Brittany Griner being on this all star team, leading the WNBA in blocks, despite being on a 2 and 10 team. Thinking about where she was at this point last year, Tony, it's just incredible that she's back to playing at the level. David Dennis Jr. Asia Wilson. Best player on the best team, 24, 11, and 9, having a dominant season uh, with the team that's most likely going to win the championship. I, I got it. She's having the best season. But I want to say Alyssa Thompson, as you mentioned, just broke the record for most triple doubles, 15, 10, yeah. and 8, having an incredible and season. And that's not a starter for you? Who are you going to throw off, though? Who are you throwing off, David Dennis Jr.? I'll let you think about it. Frank Isola, please. Well, Brianna Stewart has done exactly what you would hope that she would do for the Liberty. But how about Aaliyah Boston, the way that she's played? My only issue with Brittany Griner is the team is 2-10. They just fired their coach, and she's missed three games. It's been a struggle for Phoenix. Clint Yates. Yeah, Aaliyah Boston has the third best player efficiency rating in the league and the best field goal percentage in the league as a rookie. Stop whining to me about how she shouldn't be a starter, and she's doing it for the fever, Tony. I, I don't Work think out. anyone's arguing. Aaliyah Boston starter. I want to get back to Alyssa Thomas because she's top three in rebounds and assists in a triple-double machine. David, are you throwing anybody off? I think rookies can wait their turn. Aaliyah Boston make it oh. wait the next year. We so what are you doing here, here, David? Why don't you tell me? What you doing oh. here? Oh, that's spicy.
Cronin, Dennis, that'll be our showdown next. Rookies, look at that. An Aaron Judge toe update this weekend from Aaron Judge. He says it's still giving him pain doing anything and everything, walking included. And he says it's a torn ligament, which was the first time that was disclosed. Yankees have been saying it was a sprain. He heard it three weeks ago running into and then through the wall at Dodger Stadium with the cement base, which we call gate, gate. <laughs> Courtney, what's the level of concern with Judge's season now hearing this? It's pretty significant because these comments from Judge came two days after the Yankees said they expected him to begin baseball activities, light hitting and throwing mm, yes. over the weekend. I think he shut down for two months. David Dennis Jr. I think you should shut him down. This is really, uh, toe injuries are really concerning. They're hard to heal. We may not see Aaron Judge for a very long time. This has derailed a lot of people's careers. Mm, so concern is, is grave. Grave concern Very for grave, both of yes. you for, for Judge coming back this season or leave this summer. We'll move on. The all-time great Spurs photo we got this weekend is the showdown too. Sean Elliott, then Victor Wemanyama, then David Robinson, Manu Jalo, Nobly, and Tim Duncan. This photo makes you say what, David? First of all, it makes me say, can you imagine what this photo would have looked like if he'd have been drafted to Charlotte and what kind of legends would be meeting him at the Applebee's? But also, look at the outfits. This is the very Spursian thing. Bad outfits, great championships. That's the Spurs Cody way. Cronin. Manu Ginobili is six foot six, guys. He looks like a shrimp sandwiched in the middle there. I know seven five's tall, but whoa. That was surprising. Uh, uh. Courtney Cronin, 30 seconds of FaceTime. <laughs> The Los Angeles Angels beat the Colorado Rockies by a score of 25 to 1 on Saturday. And the most surprising part of that game was not that Shohei Otani was absent from the offensive explosion. He just had one RBI and seven at bats. It's what manager Phil Nevin said about the win. Sportsmanship very much in play here. He didn't want to embarrass Bud Black, anybody in the Rockies dugout. But what do you want to do? Have a run rule here? What do you think Florida thinks about that with LSU? They're going to take it easy on the rival? I don't think so. They still lost the series to Colorado, though. 